I'm John Travis in Sydney, locked up in a hotel for two weeks, which is a requirement to get back in the country. And it's the 2nd of January, 2020. And I have the pleasure of talking to Mandy Nolan up in Mullumbimby, where I usually live this time of year. And Mandy, um, I've known you for well, 20, well, 15 years, I think, since I mm -hmm. came to Mullum. You're, you're an icon of comedy and um, I did your comedy course uh, probably 12 13 years ago and as a, a component of wellness you know it's it's so undervalued by most of uh, as my friend Don Ardell is, is wellness is too serious uh, too important to be taken seriously and uh, you have brought uh, a lot of humor into my life so oh, I want to begin nice. Yeah, uh, I want uh, to begin with who you are and why and um, throw in a few jokes. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention uh, uh, Phyllis Diller was my babysitter. So I have it in my. Oh, blood. wow. She and my mother were friends. Uh, she was at Bluffton College when I was a kid this long before when she had dark hair and before she was famous. But uh, I do have an interview with her where she uh, uh, talks about the importance of breastfeeding. And uh, she was a wellness nut, too. So. Uh, Let's begin with where you were born, uh, siblings. I, I've seen some of this in your book, but I want to hear the story. Sure. The story. Uh, so early I'm, in okay, I'm 52, well, 53 in, in about two weeks because I was born 1968 in a country town in Queensland that's called Wandai, which is uh, means wild dog. It's... um probably a population of a couple of thousand it's your classic small country town um in kind of western queensland uh it's a very right wing area um a really lovely rural community but very fractured through politics um, um it's right on the edge of a indigenous community which was a mission town called sherberg um so when i went to school I went to school with, you know, it's weird coming to university and I was doing, you know, I was studying anthropology and there'd be all these kind of white middle-class students that had never met an Aboriginal person. I went, how could you go through your life and not meet an Aboriginal person? I went to school, half the people in my school were Indigenous or, um, you know, and I had an Indigenous sister that I grew up with. So I, I, I was quite lucky in that sense where my, my family was, my mum was a hairdresser, my dad was... Um, he was he wasn't really anything actually he was he was a bit of a wild card um he played a bit of football he um he painted houses he he was a great storyteller and was a bit of a raconteur and the one thing my family was they had they didn't really have they had no education really but they were very left-wing um thank god in yeah. a, a right-wing yeah. area yeah so i grew up with and and always had my dad particularly and my mum as well of course, is that they had very strong politics around what was good, what it meant to be a decent human being. And um, and that was really kind of a really key building block in, in my childhood. I have a brother. My dad died when I was about six and my mum would have been 26. My brother was about six months old. It was a, they had a, he had a car accident. He was a horrendous alcoholic though. Like um, he was only like 30 or 31 when he died. Like now it's weird thinking of father dying it's like he was you know i've been older than him for 22 years like you know oh. i sort of outlived him a lot so um and i was never distressed by him dying it's weird because i really loved my dad but I, I when you grew up in domestic violence like it was violent very domestically violent through the alcoholism so you just froze I did think that everyone lived like me. So I thought that until I thought everyone lived in this kind of weird family with the angry dad that came and smashed the walls down and you got locked in your bedroom or we'd sleep out in the bush or whatever. And it wasn't until I stayed at my friend's house, a girl called Karen Preston and her family, that like her dad was a scientist and her mum was a school teacher or something and they ate brown bread. Like I never knew bread could be brown. Like I was like, there's something wrong with that bread. Like that bread is not right and after and after dinner they played scrabble and i like it was so weird i came home and went that i never want to go there again that family is weird like because you become so normalized to dysfunction so i did realize i was a kid that had this i was quite um 
I was a bit of a Woody Allen child in a sense. I thought about death a lot. I thought about um, life and what it meant. And I think when you're a child that's growing up in trauma, um, mm-hmm. you, the way you, you – and, of course, I, you, you become a lot more complex than the way you think. And, of course, I had full-on OCD, but nobody ever noticed. I only noticed my OCD when I went to a psychiatrist to talk about my son's OCD. And then when they told them my story – they went, and what I used to do, they went, oh, no, no, you definitely had OCD. I grew out of most of the stuff. But anyway, my dad died when I was six, and I had um, made this this kind of, I had sort of this feeling that if my life was going to mean anything or do anything, this is a six-year-old, that he couldn't be, he had to go. I didn't know how he was going to go, but he had to go. So when he died, I had this incredible strong sense of destiny of like okay it's like it was like game on it's okay that I was out of this situation because it was it's an unlivable situation when you live like that so um and even though there was a lot of grief you know because I really love my dad um it was so clear that you could not sustain a life living like that it was so Mm -hmm. dangerous you know it was like we would die he had you know we nearly um I think once it was just full on because he also used to keep guns and stuff as well. And my mum hated it. So she'd hide the guns. And one time he'd go up on these benders and he'd gone for days and he'd come back and he came back once and he'd beaten a cop up. And it, so he was in a pursuit where he's being followed. And he said to my mum, there's only one way out of it, Carol, I've got to shoot my way out. So he got to the house, he was looking for his guns. He was going to shoot the police from the house. Well, like his wife and child in it, right? Have a shootout. Oh, boy. Yeah, Mum had hidden the guns, fortunately. He couldn't find it. By that stage, like, all these cop cars pulled up and it took heaps of them. They had to basically uh, tranquilize him to get him to the hospital oh. um, and to kind of to sedate him. Um, and eventually, um, I think he died about a year. I think he got clean. I think he got sober for a year. Then he picked up and then he was in a car accident. But it was a fairly, it was, it was a full-on time. So... Clearly um, not funny, but kind of was. Like I kind of see it. I think that experience in itself was um, really beneficial for me to develop. Um, what, it really helps you to develop a sense of understanding of what people live through because when you've lived through it yourself, um, you and you and because if you haven't lived it, you don't know it. You don't know what real violence is. You don't know what real fear is. You don't know wh- what it is to live on the bones of your ass. And and what it is for children to live in trauma and the kind of the kind of um, the strange and fucked up narrative you create in your head to make sense of the world and that sort of was where my comedic narrative came from because I, I had a very um, I had a, I had a very vivid imagination and I made I was quite religious so I always made contracts with God about me. And it was always this thing of that was I would set these things to God going, all right, God. It's funny because I'm not religious anymore, but I always have this thing. I went, if this means this, then this has to like I was like, I was like playing with God, going, all right, God, if if you want me to believe in you, you better do this. You know, that sort of thing. Right. Um I was actually I was pulling God on, going like, okay, you know, all this bullshit, and I'm living like this, and I'm a kid. Well, how about you do this? Well, I sort of had that in my head as a contract. And then he died and I went, fuck, I've got some real power. Uh, uh-huh. but be careful how I use it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that was um, that was kind of my childhood. And then, I, as I said before, I, um, for, I had my brother who was six years old, um, younger than me, and Shirley who is one year younger than me and she's not biologically related to me, but she lived with us indigenous girl that lived with us until she was about 14 so um so i grew up in a country town that was really like living in the deep south really racist um you know with a black sister yeah so how did that to... affect you with uh at school or was that a, oh yeah uh... you get teased everyone go you get a black sister um yeah. in, in that sense you would get teased from about you know i remember once i wasn't wouldn't walk on the same side of the road as well because I was getting teased. And I got home and my grandmother gave me, um, she never ever hit me except that time. And she she really gave me, she got she gave me a, a good feather dusting around the butt for for not um, for doing that. And I actually totally like I don't agree in whipping children, but I tell you what, I actually went, yeah, 
Yeah, that was a good one. Because I really remember that. And I remember that's how much she actually held that as a value is that you don't, you don't sort of neglect someone who's part of your family and, you know, because of their skin colour. So that how was pretty cool. To, how did she happen to, to live with your family? What was um, it was because her, um, her father was, um, her father was one of, my father was a bit of a dreamer. So he always did things like he had, we never had any money, but he'd have a speedboat, you know, or he'd get a racehorse. And we get a racehorse and we lived near a racetrack and he had to get a race trainer. Shirley's father was a race trainer. And in the community, what happens often is um, <clears throat> he was one of those men that <clears throat> he would go to. Um, he had a relationship with someone who lived in, in the Indigenous community. And that lady, I never met her, that was Shirley's mum. She got pregnant and left the baby on his doorstep. So Shirley never knew her um, mm -hmm. biological mother. Um, and so she grew up with her grandmother. Her grandmother died when she was about two. And, and because she, she was left with a man who really didn't know how to care for her um, and who, who had an alcohol problem as well, um, she got left with us a lot. Um, and so in between most of the time when she wasn't with her, her dad, um, she'd be staying at our house. And so that's how she that's how she grew, we grew up, and it very much become now very much we always see each other as sisters. We, you know, her kids are my nieces and nephews, and and my, and vice versa. So, it, and it's interesting, isn't it? Because it was never formalised through a fostering mm -hmm. or anything like that. It just happened, and I think there's often many many familial relationships like that. And and she sees my mum as her mum, you know, and she doesn't know her mum. So that's a really important relationship for her to have and my mum was a mum to her so I also have another sister who's adopted with my mum remarried when she was 26 and my other sister's Sri Lankan so I come from a real racist area <laughs> two black sisters <laughs> which is kind of cool I, that's great I love that um that's quite funny isn't it how, how your family that you start off with here I'm drinking my whiskey my whiskey water <laughs> isn't so growing up there I always, I always thought differently to most most kids that I knew. I was always a very deep thinker. I always had very dark thoughts. Um, and I, I, you know, I loved, um, I played a lot of fantasy games as a kid where I'd pretend, like I would be set lots of chores by my mother because she was a single parent from very young. Like I was doing all the housework at the age of eight when she went to work and my brother would be in care somewhere and I'd be left alone at home. Like eight years old, there's no way I would let my kid at home. But I would have like, I had to clean the entire house, do the bath, put the washing out. So I used to play a game that I was a paraplegic. Um, <laughs> but I was a, but, but I was a princess and my family didn't love me because, and I had to, to get love, I had to do all these jobs. So I did all the jobs my mother sent me, but I would pull myself around the floor like I had, like I had no, I was paralyzed from the waist down. So I'd be cleaning the bath, but I'd be like, like I fully, fully, and I, I used to wait for her because I actually enjoyed doing the housework because I'd made this amazing elaborate game of how, how tortured and loved I was. And I remember mum coming home once and I didn't hear her and I didn't hear it. And I was dragging myself up the hallway with like the, the dust cloth and stuff like that. And she goes, what the bloody hell are you doing? <laughs> Get off the floor. Yes, I, I did have, um, that's before you had PlayStations and stuff, so you could, you had to, you had to use your own dysfunction to create fun. Just for our viewers, <laughs> uh, there, you have an audience here. Uh, Hi, Yvonne. <laughs> <laughs> I love an audience. They're, they're I'm, I'm so hear... identifying with a lot of your story. It, it, it had a similar background anyway. With the laugh that's track, you know. I, I wanted to explain the laugh track. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah, so, so that wow. was, that's where I come from. That's my country town and my. Now they filmed uh, Mystery Road out there, the movies in Western Queensland. Was it anywhere near, or have you seen the movies? I haven't seen the movie. I'm not sure exactly where it was. I'm not sure whether that yeah. was further north than where I came from. But they did. They did film a, a Bruce Beresford film there years ago called The Fringe Dwellers, and it's so it's so typical of my mother. My mom is a really and she still is. Mum's a really beautiful woman and she was widowed at 26. Like she had blokes throwing thongs in the front yard. Like she did stay single um, for quite a long time. She was not interested in 
so she was a really good mum and she was not in, she was very lonely but not interested in a relationship and she wasn't interested in a relationship with those type of men that she'd been with before like that was just after what she'd lived through and um and uh, she did but she was very pragmatic mum was like she worked really hard she brought us up in a way like so poor but we it was that classic thing of you know she made sure we never went out without anything so she's filling up at the petrol station her car one day and there's the the talent scouts for the film the fringe dwellers which is quite a kind of well-known australian film at the time and they were looking for this particular it was a speaking role in a feature film and they went up to her and went would you could you come and audition for this part we think you you look exactly right and she goes no i've got to work um <laughs> just i said that's so my mom like you're so responsible and I went, you would have got paid, you know. You would have actually got paid. Yeah. That's not, but I had a, I, I'd work on. I couldn't go. And um, kind of like that about mum. It's kind of funny. She's very pragmatic in that. Like she wouldn't, she'd go, no, oh, well. That was my opportunity. To, and she would have only been then probably 27 or 28. Like, but she, because she was widowed at 26, to her, she felt old. Like I was, when I left home, my mum was 36. It's pretty young. I left home at 16. You know, and she was like, you know, that's, you know, 36 is young. Well, some people are only having babies at 36. So, you know, so her children, her son left home when she was about 41 or something. But, you know, her first, she was 19 when she had me. So she was, she was a young mum and she learned a lot. You know, we're very close because of it, but it was also creates a very different type of relationship, I think, because it started in such, um, you know, dice and she was such a victim in those situations she had to really work on herself through my whole childhood to come out of the you know horrendous abuse that she'd been through so is she where does she live now she's in calandra she went from being a hairdresser she went to university um she studied um she became a community development manager she's got a really she, she got to mum never went past grade 10 or something she never thought she was very bright but as it turns out she was really bright and she has mm -hmm. a huge passion for social justice and that was the area that she ended up moving into uh, and working into which she absolutely loves mum's highly politicized um can't get her off if you ring her like you she's constantly She's all over American politics, all over. I thought she loves it. Her passion is politics. So um, it's kind of what, interesting. Yeah, what led her to become left wing in a in a country town like this? Her family upbringing, or that, that, that's yeah. A... My my grandfather was a communist. Um, uh, it's in the blood. We actually, it's quite funny in our family is that even though they're all country people, my grandfather who I actually think after mum doesn't think so, but I, she was showing me something and I went, oh, mum, you're my grandpa. I never met him because he died before I was born, but I went, he's clearly was gay. I mean, he's a cabaret singer. He, um, he, he there's a whole lot of things. I went, he had a, he was, at the end, he, was, he used to do cabaret singing on the weekends and he's an electrician. He goes, the happiest he was was when his, his assistant, Jimmy, a young Asian boy, lived with them for two years. And I went, are you? <laughs> I hope that's just sounding a little bit like perhaps that was his lover. Uh, she goes, oh, do you think so? No, I think they're just really close. Uh, and, there's a, and I went, <laughs> but anyway, my, that grandfather was a very deep thinking kind of, um, you know, and widely read person. Even though he worked in a trade, he was very self-schooled and he was an absolute atheist um, and, uh, and a member of the Communist Party. Um, on the other side of my family, my father's side, they 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 are always very left wing as well. They're the real working class, but absolute. Um, I don't think anyone had ever finished school until my generation. Mm. They weren't big. They weren't big on learning or earning, <laughs> <laughs> but they love drinking and they love rooting. <laughs> I think I kind of come from somewhere a bit like Shit's Creek. Yeah, I don't know if you've seen that, but it's a bit like my town. That's a, a good connection. Yeah, that's where the so aspirations you were the, are. You were the oldest, and uh, uh, so you went off at sixteen. And I remember some wild stories about college in uh, Brisbane, wasn't it? That you went to? Yeah, I left. Yeah, sixteen. I'd finished. Well, the weird thing in Queensland, when you say you leave home at sixteen, it sounds like you've left home before you finish school. But I'd finished school. I, Queensland has this weird thing 
and they've just changed it now where they have one year less for some reason. And that's probably a big part of, of Queensland, not quite having it up to scratch for many years. But, and I started school when I was four. So I finished at 16. So I, then I went on to um, university, which was, um, that was such a big change for me. Cause it was, and I, you know, and I realized, I mean, I always loved, I did really well at school. I was just so lucky to have a couple of great teachers you know, where you have an amazing teacher that, um, and a lovely thing in my school, my English teacher actually, and she, um, she was amazing. And she, she just really found something in my writing, which just, it, you know, it seeded my belief in my, in my ability to write when I was about 11 or 12 years old. And as much as having a Nash and that, like a natural talent, having a teacher, not a parent, I actually think a teacher that, um, can mentor you or sees mm -hmm. that is amazing and now when I do my comedy shows like she turned up to see me at a show about 10 years ago and then she comes to my shows it's always really nice and I've got a few teachers in my life that have come to my shows or they've followed what I do and it's actually a really it's a great compliment um that they've made they've maintained any interest so I had her and then I had the creepy art teacher oh my god he was creepy that was the one that decided he fell in love with me and nothing happened like he didn't she didn't try to touch me, he just cried in the art room. I was about 15 then and showed me, he read all this disgusting poetry he'd been writing for me and that was just creepy. Um, so he wasn't a great teacher. <laughs> it was not good, but the good ones made it through. So when I went to uni, it was good. I was a bit lonely at first. I, I found the jump from school to academic thinking um, really big. I felt very unprepared intellectually for um, critical thinking. Because I really, really, I was really aware of it. Even though I was naturally a critical thinker, I, it was so clear that thing where you actually just kind of, you know, it was very much education in my era too, where you just, you pretty well regurgitated what you've been fed. And then suddenly you'd be put in an academic and have to do a critique on something. I couldn't even understand how you're supposed to do that. Like how, how to properly research and resource, how to, how to do things like that. It took me the first six months to work that out. Then I found Jermaine Greer's The Female Eunuch and um, and I'd been in a modelling agency in my first six. Like I was a you know, very tall girl and at 16, you know, that was a big achievement. It was kind of like my family for me to go to university and I was in a modelling agency modelling and it was like, oh, my God, she's smart but she's beautiful and she's working in this, you know, it was like it was an achievement but it sort of wasn't and I felt weird about it but I didn't know why. Um and then I read The Female Eunuch and then understanding the idea of what nurture means, that it's not all that, what it means to be female, that, you know, perhaps, you know, a whole lot around my gender was, had been created and manufactured. And it's almost, I've kind of pretty well finished that book and completely changed the way I saw the world. I um, certainly never modelled again. I um, changed the way I, pro it, was, it was fantastic. Like it was an absolute liberation for me. It was, it was probably uh, one of those moments because, as a woman where I found my identity beyond my physicality. And as a young woman, you're so tied into your physical appearance. And so it was really liberating to let go of that. And of course, as years went on, I went back to, you know, I'd shaved my head. I, grew, I was quite radical. I, you know, grew my armpit hair, told men to go fuck themselves. Um, it was pretty, it was a fabulous time. Uh, but then I went, you know, became more, um, <clears throat> So I, I, you know, I, I changed my politics, evolved. But I think it's a really, without saying it, without being, I'm not saying people should be radicalised, but allow your thinking to, to transform and those really amazing moments where um, you realise, particularly as a young person, how much I'd been indoctrinated by what I thought just was. I just thought that's what it meant to be a girl like I but it never felt right like I could my, my I felt weird in my identity and suddenly I went oh this is what's put on us and as a girl that's grown up in domestic violence who's seen the worst side of toxic masculinity and the worst side of almost toxic femininity and, and an ability to like where that came together it kind of made sense that to break that you almost had to go right back to break these core values that had just poisoned the way men and women relate to each other, I think. 
and who we are. And as a woman to go, well, who am I? What do I sound like? What can I do in this world? What is limiting me? What are people saying about what I can do? What, what am I facing every day? And, you know, and, and being a woman doesn't make you less than. Because even back then it was kind of like, you know, you were just constantly, um, you know, women, it's always hard to explain, but, you know, the sexism you encounter was pretty constant, particularly as a young oh. woman. It was pretty, and, and I'd just come out of the art teacher experience and all, you know, and the Catholic priest experience. How about that? Oh, what was that Catholic experience? Catholic priest experience. Yeah, let's oh. hear that. <laughs> Everyone goes, tell me about the Catholic priest experience. Um, that was another thing. And that was as a young girl that had no, no significant, because my father died when I was six, but I had no men in my life, none. Like maybe an uncle that popped in occasionally. That was it. Mum didn't really have partners. She had the odd person here and there. She didn't remarry until I'd left home. So I didn't really understand what men were. So older men were always really attracted to me. And I was always kind of interested in older men, older men like someone who's 30, that's what I'm talking about. Um, or, you know, but not boys my own age. I, I would have boyfriends, but I was not whatever. So it was a Catholic priest that came to our country town. And he was young and handsome, well, 30, you know, old or young. And he said, um, it was quite funny, mum's, there, there'd been a, his, he had his mother with him. He was like, I think it was a priest that was whatever they do when they're um, like a locum <laughs> where the other priest was away. So he was, look, he was looking after the parish for six weeks. And the, at that time in the 80s, there'd been, in Australia, there'd been a mother and daughter do a Playboy shoot, like a pet, like a, you know, a nude shoot for a, one of those cheap pornographic magazines. And they looked a lot like my mother and me because mum and I only have a short amount of just like in our age. And his mother was horrified. She goes, they're here. That mother and daughter that did that nude centerfold for the for Playboy or whatever it was, they're here. And of course it was not. But of course he went, I'm going to get to meet these people. So he makes himself known to my mother and myself and then becomes, of course, you know, he's young and charming and mum has him over for dinner and and becomes a family friend for that short amount of time. And he's, you know, he's fabulous. And, he, and I was going to uni the next year. And I said, he said, oh, well, when you're going to uni, look me up and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll take you, you know, I'll take you to a gallery or I'll show you around or something like that. And so and that's what happened. But then as it went on, you could see it was kind of a bit of a groomy relationship. And then I ended up in about six month relationship with a Catholic priest, which was, and it ended when he told me that he, he um, couldn't be with me anymore because he was gay. <laughs> I just went, okay. And, and then see, it was after that. That was the first six months of me leaving home. And that's when after that, the next six months, I found feminism, um, which protected me with my superpower from, from weirdos like that. But that was, it's funny, with all the stuff that's come out with all that inquiries, and I often look him up and he's in a very... He's in quite a high position within the Catholic Church, um, mm. and he was always ambitious. And I often wonder. I mean, I was seventeen. I was sixteen when I met him, and I was seventeen when we had a sexual relationship. Underneath the, in, in, now I know they've expanded who they see as a, um, as a, um, what do you call a vulnerable person, and they've expanded that to eighteen within the Catholic Church. And I've never gone on and gone, I haven't reported it or done anything like that. But sometimes you wonder, you know, you really do. You go, you know, it, it's in that really kind of narrow kind of thing. You're going, was that something that was reportable? You know, I don't feel, I don't feel harmed by it. So I, I don't do it. But what, what, if he, what, if, what if he had a relationship with another young person and they just need more people? So it's always to come Probably forward. Good. So. It's always one of those things where I've always felt very, um, what would you say, um, challenged or, or really confused about, you know, where it's at. Like, was that on the, like, I don't know. Because if I'd been 15, yes. 16, yes. 17, going, oh, it's right on the edge of, um, and I, because I don't feel in any way, um, you know, I, I'm not, traumatized from it but, well, I in, terms of, but I, in terms of your your bargaining with god you've got a real uh wild card yeah. there i know <laughs> i've got one it. to use you can say that 
<laughs> I know. <laughs> I went, hey, God, how about this? Ba -boom. <laughs> um, yeah, so I wonder. It is, um, it's interesting, isn't it? Because that's about abuse of power. And in those relationships where, where older people in those um, extreme positions of um, authority and power, you go, so need to be mindful of how they use it. You know, and there's yeah. some, and, and that was part of my feminist politic too, was realizing I had been falling into a different sort of institutionalized power relationship, but it came a lot through the sexual and sexist relationship of male and female stuff as well. So, um, yeah. And then for him to say he was gay, that was a bit weird. <laughs> so I was like, going, well, okay, fair enough. I thought you were going to say you couldn't see me because you're a priest. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> that would have been the obvious thing to say. Forget that. Yeah, no, forget that. It was, um, yeah, so I was like, wow, men are weird. You know, so now were you at QU? What, what uni were you at? University of Queensland. And yeah. I did studying journalism. And I did, I was one of those degrees where I did literature, journalism. And then I did, a, you know, I was one of those art students that just did a bit of everything. I did philosophy, I did anthropology, I did sociology, I did political studies, I did, um, go on this, you know, psychology. And it's funny at the time, and I, and I think, um, and I did like, when I did literature, I did literary theory. I really loved doing literary theory, weirdly, which is the most ridiculous thing to do. You'll never get a job, but you will learn how to do a good analysis. And, and it, I think we've become so, I know with my kids looking at what they're studying, I keep going, don't worry about what it's going to cost. doesn't matter. Don't, you won't know what you want to do. I said, just engage in the process of learning. Like you'll, it doesn't matter. Like something will kind of light your flame and you'll just go for it. And it's, I said, you never regret learning. You never go, oh my God, I wish I didn't learn that. Like you don't regret knowledge and expand. Like it's, and you can't see, like now I can see everything I did at university has informed who I am, how I think, and what I do as a comedian and as a writer. But there was never a course that said, do you want to be a comedian and a writer and a social commentator? We'll do these things. But in a sense, I chose all my subjects perfectly because it gave me a fairly well-rounded grounding, not in anything specifically that I could ever lecture in it or, or write a paper in it, but so that I could read things and, and, and be able to have some sort of analysis and and make my own thinking from it so it, it's been invaluable like I loved it it was you know and then I never knew I, I mean I did comedy but I certainly never intended to be a comedian I'm the next mine was just, I just ended up doing it because it, it, it was something I could do without meaning without meaning to it didn't seem in that never had any value to me not like now everyone wants to be a comedian now and I'm like my god that's the last thing I wanted to be. I could just do it, you know. Uh, there's a story in one of your books uh, of something about you and three roommates or whatever locked out of your apartment that for some reason that's sticking in my mind is a, kind of a wild incident, but somebody, you were locked out. Does this ring any bells or am I remembering? Is that the one where I did live in a house? Um, it was so much fun. I had some of the best, you know those share housing experiences when you're young and you're living with all your university dropout friends and whoever, they're just the best times of your life. You know, you're drinking and partying and studying and protesting and having sex and taking heaps of drugs and writing an assignment at three in the morning on speed. <laughs> all the shit that you do. We lived in this, there was five girls and we lived together for two years, the same five. We became really inseparable. And we became kind of like, we would have been a terrifying group of five girls to come near because we were not passive. We're all feminists and we're all, we're all pretty wild. Anyway, and we lived, we lived loose, but we all worked really hard. And we, come, we were coming home. I think this is the one where we'd gone, we'd gone out somewhere as we were coming home. There was a man coming through the window. Is this the one? Yeah, that was it. Yeah, there's a dude coming through and like a homeless dude coming out a window. And we're like, on oh, the steps and he's coming out. And we went, hey, hey. And then he's all angry and he goes, oh, you don't even have tea. And it was like, really, because we had no food at home because we never had anything because we're living on, you know, but, you know, student money. We're spending it on alcohol, not actual food. But it was so funny getting castigated by a homeless bloke that's broken into your house because you don't even have tea. And I went, that is shameful that we don't have tea. People, when they break in for a cup of tea, can't even have a cup of tea. 
<laughs> it was pretty That's funny. Fun. We had we had a pretty well. We had a great time. That was a really great fun. That was such a fun time. And I'm still that group of girls. You know, we've got one girl in New York, two girls in Melbourne, and one up in Queensland. And we we still. We have a Facebook chat group that we're on all the time that we chat. We, it's, a, oh. it's an enduring five-way friendship. Uh-huh. Really, they're beautiful, those friendships. Now, when did your actual first comedy you know, show up? When, when did that in your I reckon I was about, same thing, about 17. It was my, probably my second year at university, maybe uh-huh. my first year in the second semester. And um, I did some feminist theatre. It was group theatre. It was like poetry and all that kind of stuff. And someone said, oh, you should tell a story, Manny, because you're really funny when you tell a story. And so I just told this, wrote a story and, and just delivered it word for word. And it was pretty funny. And I did it in a university, one of those review things. That, and then I got booked for a comedy club pretty well oh. straight away. And, never, and I started working and I was... It wasn't any good. It was terrible. I didn't know what it was doing, but I, I just write stuff out and recite it because I didn't even know what comedy was in that sense. But I'd suddenly be in a room in front of, you know, a couple hundred people doing this thing, you know. So it took me a long time to work out what I was doing because there wasn't anyone really that I saw where I was living in Brisbane. There was only about one or two other comics and I was one of them. So that was, that was interesting. But because I started... And I, and I could actually do it. Like I could hold the stage. I could get a laugh. I kind of got a feel of what it felt like. But then, then it took me probably another 10 years to really get my voice. I didn't really, I, I changed, I would chop and change. I'd, you know, I, was, I wasn't good until I was about 28. Mm-hmm. Then I got pretty average. <laughs> but I didn't yeah, know. Average. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know though, because I have really high self-esteem. I've always thought I was better than I was. It's only in retrospect when I look back, I went, yeah, you weren't so good, love. Um, but sometimes that makes you that kind of and the other thing I'm I don't know what the only way you get any good at comedy because I've had some dire experiences I've had things thrown at me I've been abused it's on stage yeah and off stage when you're leaving when in the other things you remember it's pretty terrifying and I was pretty good at letting it happen and um not taking it on like I'd kind of go this isn't cool but you deal with it and then I never I never I never went that's it I'm not doing that again I kind of went oh this is part of it. it's kind of you know it's pretty ropey out there and behavior is pretty out there but as I got better I could manage people people wouldn't behave like this different times in the 80s and early 90s people behaved much more horrendously in the comedy scene they thought that was what you're supposed to do that audience is a lot more trained into what comedy is and mm-hmm. i would never lose an audience like that anymore i can walk into audience. i did one recently it's funny i had all these young comics on us in sydney and the audience was pretty though drunk and yelling out and i just knew that when i went out i went oh it's fine i was actually really looking for because I, I walk out and everyone's been these young boys they're really fabulous young blokes great comics but i walk out to the audience and i'm like someone's mum who gets out there and there's one thing drunk blokes frightened of, and that's fucking mums, like especially cranky <laughs> mums. And so I just, I just slammed this guy down verbally, um, you know, you know. And I, you kind of, have, and I went, wow, how good is it to have this ability when you can actually? It's, it's taken a long time, it's taken thirty years to get this ability that I never thought I'd have, which is to be able to be in the moment, take control of it, take charge, and you know, make make it mine, you know, and. That takes a lot of practice, takes years, years and years. And takes failing a lot and it takes being humiliated a lot to learn anything. You don't just suddenly be good at it. Wow. Yeah. So after your your four, four years at uni? Yeah, so about four years. And then I took off and I went traveling with a boyfriend who turned out to be a bit of a gigolo. So we went off with him, um, went north. Thought where I'd live in northern Queensland for a while. It's too hot. Oh yeah. But it's, it's really boring. Like once you would get a, it was really lovely. We'd get a boat out. And we'd we'd swim around. We'd camp on an island and kind of snorkel around the reef. And like when you've done that ten times, you know oh. it's just it's just hot. And I just went, oh, we got to get out of here. So then I moved to Canberra. 
um, which wasn't anywhere I wanted to go, but my boyfriend at the time decided he wanted to be a political journalist. Oh, that's it. I was in Canberra for about a year. Did a bit more. That's where I supported Whoopi Goldberg. Um, she was coming to town. She's like one of my heroes as a young comic. And I went, wow. I knew within um, Australia they have this rules about um, who can support. Like you, Not the same anymore. They used to have a thing that every international act had to have an Australian support act. And so I went to see the touring agent and went, you, you, you'll have to put me on as a support act because you have to have an Australian. There's no other female comedian here in Canberra. So I got the job. The rule was I wasn't allowed on stage and I wasn't allowed to speak. So I did it with another friend of mine, a fabulous woman called Miliana, um, and we had to dress up as homeless women, not speaking, mute homeless women, and pretty well uh, hassle people in the foyer. So it was not a great job, but I can always say I supported Whoopi Goldberg. So that was my highlight of Canberra. I left there. And then I moved sort of up here to, to Byron Bay as a six-month just drop-in. Um, and I, I went, oh, my God, I'll never stay here. It's too parochial. And then something weird happened. Like I kind of, I don't know, it's kind of like, like I fell asleep at a party and woke up and my life had happened. Like it just became, I tried to leave here many times and just always came back. And it's weird now because now everyone used to go, what are you living there for? And now all those people, they're all coming here. And you're going, did you not come here? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't it funny? Because all the things I was judged for, for living in this place, which seemed like it was at the end of the earth. And then everybody else goes, oh, um, it just felt like the right place. I just went energetically, you know, and I knew I was never to be a proper comedian who had a, a conventional, conventional career. I really needed to stay in Sydney or Melbourne. And I'd, I'd stayed in both those places for various times, for a couple of months at a time, but I'm a country girl and I really preferred to live in the country. Uh -huh. And in a way, my career, weirdly, I got better as a comedian because I, a big part of my career is community engagement. I'd be performing at rallies or I'd do a fundraiser or I'd be working. It was often engaged with activism or was engaged with community stuff. And I think I create, I, I think what I did was quite unique in I'm out, I've always been outside the comedy circuit in that way, but I've, I've forged it. I think I'm a modern version of the village idiot. Like I've been my village's idiot, you know, for them to translate and have conversations and take the piss and, you know, and often people ask, when people ask me to, I get like requests for subjects, like, can you write about this? Because they're not going to do it, but they want me to do it. <laughs> Put my neck on the chopping block. Interesting. Well, um, you're, uh, uh, book the the boyfriends I've had and shouldn't have. I just mention this. I'll, I'll put a link in the uh, narrative. Each chapter describes a different psychopathology, which I thought it was the the funniest psychology book I've ever read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, the the way too many boyfriends to list here, but uh, there was a lot a resource for. For people to uh, access that book, uh, I think it would make a wonderful high school psychology text if, it, if you'd have to clean up the language a little bit to get it accepted by the school system. But, uh, but you never know. My husband says that too. Actually, he says that he goes, "Oh, that he thought that was a good training manual, manual, like really good for thing for men to read." Yeah, it's exactly. a relationship. It's a fantastic psychology relationship teaching manual and something that high school kids could relate to and at, at a point where they could make a difference in their lives. Yeah. See that, you know, you've got every, every pathology laid out with humor. So. I know because there was always so many, well, it was kind of nice having an opportunity to go back through, you know, often they're like, you know, this relationship war zones where you're just lucky to get out of them, but you kind of realize you learn a bit about people as you go. And after a while, people start to be a bit the same, like, oh, that person acts like the, oh, and people aren't that different in their behaviours, like certain types of people, and in comedy, that's what you notice, like you're always looking for those commonalities and where you can draw the line, and so it's kind of fun when you're going like, oh, this is the kind of thing, that, uh, dudes like this, this is what they say, or this is what how I behave in this situation, so those commonalities, once you can actually address them and, and pinpoint them, are, are, 
they're a gift. They don't feel like it at the time. It doesn't feel like your failed relationship. It could be a tax deduction. I went, wow, I can <laughs> I can make all these losers a tax deduction. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was um. Well, when I signed really up, terrible. For, sorry, I signed up for your comedy course through the local community uh, adult education program. That that would have been probably two thousand eight, I think, uh, and. Um, and I'd been to a number of your performances and you had kept talking about this, uh, your, your husband, John, but uh, I, I'd come to your house, you know, when you coached us on our uh, five minute uh, virgin yeah. sacrifice that everyone had to do at the, at the final performance. And there was, no, there was no John there. And I think it was like 10 years later before I met John. Yeah, I know. The, the alleged John. Can we keep it top secret. Pardon? Yeah, we kept him top secret. Yeah, and, and uh, it turns out to be in my field of interest, and we have a lot of common commonalities. And uh, the, the two of you together was like, what? what? I know, what? it's funny. <laughs> Opposite. Yeah, it was a surprising relationship for me at the end, you know, because I've always gone for more artistic types. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like people are more in the art sector, and John comes from the health sector, and he's, you know, he's, he's a rational solid um kind of thinker he's he's a really decent he's very different type. most of the men i've been with were fairly self-centered i have to admit so john's different sort of bloke he's kind of more yeah. um he's grounded he's kind of got a good sense of community he's, it was really good and so it was kind of different i so it was kind of refreshing i think i'd gone through all my artistic folks and i went oh god if i never go out with another artistic fellow again it'll be good um, <laughs> apologies to artistic men i'm sure you're not all terrible but i think i found the worst ones of you the one not the worst but just just difficult and i probably wasn't great either so you know I'll, I'll wear part of that but it was really nice to be with a man that um just came from a different it's also nice when you're in a relationship to have someone that's not from your field sometimes like if you've got someone yeah. who's always exactly from where you come from um it, so now, you're not, how did you're you not getting a new perspective. Oh, we met at the school pickup, which is where you pick your kids up. Oh. And not where you pick up your new partner, but I did, <laughs> I did find him at the pickup, which I thought was funny. But we became friends six or seven years before we, or maybe even more actually, maybe eight years before we ever sort of became romantic. Um, and, you know, he was a single dad and I was married with three kids. And then when my relationship, I'd, our kids were friends and so we would see each other um, intermittently when the kids were being dropped off and having sleepovers. And then when I broke up, you know, as my relationship failed with my husband, you know, we sort of started to sort of talk. And then when I did split up, we sort of looked at sort of, you know, possibility of, you know, seeing each other and it worked you know it was kind of it, it was kind of it was it was it was interesting that it worked because the situation was so hard it kind of shouldn't have worked so we had he had a daughter you know I had three kids and then we talked about I was I was probably 40 and I went oh but I really would like to have one more child I think and he said I would too and honestly you should be very careful when you say that because I think I was pregnant 10 minutes later I didn't mean like now <laughs> um, but I guess if it hadn't happened that quickly at that age, I wouldn't have had another child. So mm -hmm. that daughter is now 11, nearly 12. Um, it's a real sweetheart. She's a great kid. Yeah, um, I've, I've been reading yeah. Ivy when I met John was about uh, eight, seven, eight years ago. Or, yeah. Uh, so yeah, what, she... what school was the pickup at? That, um, uh, it's a Catholic to... school in Byron Bay called St. Finbar's. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then Little, what was your first date like when you actually called it a date? I, I'm, oh. I'd like to get, I've got his side already recorded. I want to hear your side of it. <laughs> See how they first date? I can't even remember what our first date was. Um, did we go anywhere? I don't think we went anywhere. I think we pretended to go somewhere as far as I remember. I think we were going, maybe we we're going to see, um, I think we we're going to see a play, but I think we ended up going. I think we made it out of the house. You were, were you in that stage of a relationship where you go to go something and um, you just don't make it out. Yeah. That was probably, that's the first date I remember. Um, but we might've had, there might've been a time where we made it out of the house. 
Oh, I do remember one time he came over to take me out. Oh, my God. Because he's just such a terrible dresser as well. That was one thing I've had to really struggle with. Like, all the men I've been with have probably much better dresses than John. And he just turned up in the... He, like, he didn't have the right jeans. And he, something was said, I would have to go buy some pants or something. I didn't know this. He turns up and I go, oh, my God, he's taking me out in public. And he's got the worst, like, really high-waisted, tight denim jeans. Like, it really like acid wash jeans like right up here and really really tight around his balls like absolutely wrong it looked like he had some sort of camel toe that women get like really bad male camel toe is something else and i just our know, audience oh. is really laughing because this is our story too <laughs> it's like yeah, it's hard isn't it and i went oh my god it's got to get those jeans off they're just horrendous um and that was pretty funny. Like, um, I can't remember where we even went. I just remember the jeans. And I sort of went afterwards. I went, you were never wearing these jeans again. These are going in the back. And often I do go into his cupboard. He doesn't, he'll go, where's that shirt? That I'll, like this shirt, like some shirt. And I'm like, maybe it's gone. Like what'll happen? I may not throw it out, but I'll put it in the ironing basket so far at the bottom, he'll never find it. <laughs> like, so it's, uh, it's not like it's like ethnic cleansing but of someone's wardrobe <laughs> you just take out the stuff that and if one will know this there's some clothes that men can wear you should realize that you don't know what they are and you'll put it on you'll love it but it makes you entirely unrootable so you <laughs> need that clothing to go because women are very sensitive to stuff to texture to something like that it's all it takes and you're like not nah, game over not not interested so that's why the jeans had to be hidden because I went second wearing of them, we won't be going anywhere. So, so shallow. To, to uh, pardon, uh, uh, to uh, to round out for our viewers, you you've got the comedy uh, uh, gig. You're teaching it. You're doing performances. You're writing a, a soapbox column every week in the local paper that I was fascinated with and urged you to, to make a book out of it, which you've just done. And uh, I'm eager to, to see it. You are organizing the, that whole section of the inter entertainment section of the paper. I mean, there's a list of things that you do. Uh, your journalism training obviously uh, paid off. And your mom to all these kids, um, many of whom are not in the house anymore, but you're, you're so multi-talented and busy and they're all wellness related to me from the comedy to the to the uh, um well i, I gotta I say political i mean your your yeah. uh, your um columns have gotten pretty deeply philosophical and with all the polarity going on now there's lots to write about and uh, i remember when you were coaching me on my uh, five minute Virgin sacrifice. I was impressed at how much you knew about. Like mine was about circumcision, breastfeeding, and attachment of infants. You knew all the stuff, and you were helping me make jokes out of it. So, um, your your obvious uh, wellness. I circumcised a few men. You have. <laughs> no, I haven't. <laughs> no. Well. Uh, I'm across most topics, I think. When you, when you do comedy, you have to kind of be across most things and, and sort of be across what the, what the dialogues are around it and the more interesting. Like if, 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 there's, if, there's, a, if there's a topic here and everyone, most people think this, well, you have to know what is thought over here, what's happening over mm -hmm. there. Like you kind of have to know the other end a little mm -hmm. bit. So that's just part of the thing. With it. it does help um, in doing that, getting across because you, you can't you can't do comedy unless you're across stuff you have to actually read stuff unfortunately like you have to watch things you have to read it you have to let it percolate and see if something turns up and i remember there was an alternative health conference at the uh which now uh uh what's it essentials uh elements elements yeah uh before they converted all that and you you kicked it off and i recorded that it was i was amazed that you're talking to a bunch of mainly alternative health doctors and nurses and you had all the the right 
things. And that was the first time I heard your, your gluten intolerant intolerance uh, oh, yeah. joke. <laughs> sure, the worst thing about that is that now I actually am gluten intolerant. Oh, no. <laughs> I know. That, that joke's bit me on the ass. Like, I just really <laughs> cannot eat gluten at all. It makes me so sick. I went, that is the funniest. They've got back at me. <laughs> I blame the vegans. Yes. I think they did that. Well, um, I think we've covered a, a pretty wide range. Are there any um, significant I think we're pretty good. No, um, I think we're pretty good. Mothering. Um, I'm a big advocate for social activism. Everything, a change, conversation. Um, I, I like, I'm, you know, I'm passionate about my community. I'm passionate about doing what we need to do for, to, to you know, take action around climate change I'm you know I'm would love to see in my lifetime radical change you know however that is and if that means being a smart ass person like I am you know pointing out flaws or yeah. undermining things and great you know having conversations doing whatever I think you know that's kind of exciting you know kind of you know I'd like to see you know, I think there has to be we have to there's got to be a big change in our lives yeah, it's uh, predicted as the fourth turning in Strauss and Howe's generation yeah. theory. They're right in the thick Definitely. of it. And I've always related to the little boy pointing out the emperor was naked. And it sounds to me like you're uh, the little girl pointing out the emperor is naked. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. We agree on almost all topics except vaccines, which you won't get it's into. All, isn't that good? We don't have to, <laughs> but you know, that's one of the good things I think is for too often, um, we polarise when we don't completely meet on every view. And I think it's incredibly important to keep dialogues open. Yes. And, yeah. and to realise that as we're not, all, everyone's not going to agree on the same things all the time, you know, but there has to be space in, within the narrative for people to have different and opposing points of view without going to war, you know, without yeah. becoming, yeah. and I think, I think that's, to me, that's really important. That's an important part of, you know, it's all well and good to say that you're, you know, if you to be a disruptor, to do whatever, but you've, you've really got to allow space for, for points of view. And that's what academic thinking is supposed to teach you, isn't it? It allows you to create space for points of view yeah. and ideas that you hadn't previously considered. Um, rather than we've moved into, which I think is dangerous sometimes, um, is that we still stay open to to hearing things that uh, make us uncomfortable or we don't agree with. And that includes things for myself all the time. I often go, well, shut up, man, to just listen and see where that takes you. Um, and that you have, you have to create a space for that. Otherwise you just become tribalized through belief and that belief isn't centered in anything except I believe what other people who I believe, believe everything I believe. And that sounds like fundamentalism to me. So I think you've always got to step back and, and listen and be aware so i think it's always good i like i've got you know not everyone i know shares my, my some people friends of mine it's, it's absolutely I've got a really good friend who votes national party and i really respect that and i don't ever want to change i don't have conversations i don't want to change what she does i love who she is um and i totally get where, where she's coming from and i think i think we've got to that's a big learning curve for me because i used to really struggle with that but i don't anymore because i really appreciate um, where people come from. For our non-Australian viewers, the National Party would be what? Similar to libertarians? I'm not even sure what they... Uh, what I don't know what you have in the... The National Party, they're nothing like the Republicans. The National Party we like... I'm thinking libertarians. Is that what it is? They're like a farmer party full of farmers. But yeah, they like, they're they're like chopping trees down. Yeah. <laughs> Well, they don't like chopping trees down. They just, they like, they, they, it's very much around agriculture over nature. Yeah. Um, I you don't know, think so. the US has, uh, we have far fewer political parties than Australia has. There's, mm. there's a new one every week. With Australia has an awesome parties, don't they? I was driving yeah. behind. Oh my God, some of them are so funny. The sex party. The, I just love reading the ballot paper. And some of the parties is also really funny. Yeah. All right, well, thank you. I, I um, when I saw you just before Christmas and you were taking a break and uh, said you were what staying in bed for 
past yeah. on and, and I thought uh, I would, but I didn't. Oh, you didn't. Oh, <laughs> I can't stay in bed. I'm on a, I wake up. It's really annoying, isn't it? Like, so I look back to my early 20s or my, when I was at uni and I, you know, the ability to sleep past one o'clock, like unbelievable. Like you'd get up at one and two o'clock. Now, even if I go to bed at 3 a.m., I'm up at six. Oh. Oh, it's pain. And I'll kind of lie there and I get uncomfortable and my body hurts and I've got to get up. And I'll be tired, but I've got to get up for a while before I can go back and lie down again. What is that? Oh, what do you see for yourself in the coming uh, phase of your life as kids are more independent and Ivy will be leaving the nest in a, a few years? What uh, Are you going to slow down, speed up? or? Oh, I'm not going to slow down. This is going to be the power decade. Is it? The power decade, okay. Yeah. 50 to 60, you uh -huh. know, pedal, pedal to the metal. All right. <laughs> so yeah, I'm not well, interested. I don't like slowing down. Sort of slow, I've got heaps of time to slow down. I really enjoy living at pace. Well, and what parting words do you have for uh, future Ooh. viewers? Uh, words of wisdom. Uh, oh, I don't have any words of wisdom. I've got, um, I would just say, um, I think as a comedian, it's actually really important. Never underestimate the power of laughter. Like even in the shitter situations, like give it a couple of days and you should be able to have a laugh. Like it, and it really does. It's very therapeutic. I'm very lucky that I work in the work thing, the field that I do, because it's given me an ability, like if something really bad happens, you know, like it's really shit luck or something. Instead of my default is not to go to rage and anger, which is a pretty common default for most people when you lose control. It's usually to go to make a joke about it, which sometimes makes other people angry because I've made a joke about the situation. But for you, it, it's actually, you're not minimizing it. If it's a coping strategy, it actually helps you, you know, because most things in life you've got no control over. So it is, it does help you kind of diffuse um, your own reactions to things. I mean, yeah. Oh, my thing is, Jeff, I also say, you know, 52 and I'm a really big advocate of not using Botox and stuff like that I reckon you just stay immature <laughs> and isn't it true it's the more immature you are the better you age there, there's some line from a uh, play that my first wife used to quote of dear god please don't let me grow up it yeah. was a, a character and uh, I don't I remember who it was but yeah um yeah, it's, uh, it's, I, think, I think it's retaining that childlike enthusiasm and that yeah. silliness. Silliness is so important. Being yeah. a bit of an idiot, I think that's really important. And but, um, at age 68, finding Yvonne, who um, oh. did, did things like, you know, we'd be in the middle of a fight and she'd go, asshole, <coughs> or something like that. <laughs> 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 we'd start doing that kind of stuff with each other. I it love that so quickly. Yeah, so, see that diffuses things straight away, doesn't it? Like, and you realize you're just being a dick. You know? <laughs> well, I think uh, the good note to end on, and uh, right. thank you so much for sharing your life with us and the future generations. And I'll see you when I get back to Malam in a couple of weeks. Oh, thank you. Thanks for speaking to me from your quarantine. I feel All like right. I'm part of an historic occurrence. Yes. <laughs> in this country when people were locked up we won't even believe it in the years to come yeah take care okay all right <laughs>